fact that I was 19 years old, I was this um, kid who uh, was at UC Santa Cruz. I uh, had just gone through a very tumultuous period in my own life. I had um, dropped out of university and, and actually came close to successfully uh, suiciding. And um, out of the, that experience, which was actually, you know, in retrospect, a very positive or very uh, uh, important experience, um, I came back to Santa Cruz. I met Gregory Bateson the first day back. I met John Grinder, who was teaching a course called The Political Economy of the United States, <laughs> whereby he was... that was, a long course? Uh, well, it was long enough for him to radically espouse the overthrow of the United States government by right. whatever means necessary. <laughs> so uh, there'd be a different developmental phase of John's life. So it didn't quite work, and, um, of course. Not yet. <laughs> yeah. And um, Grinder and Bandler had just gotten together and uh, had written this book, Structure of Magic. And uh, Gregory Bateson, who lived on the same property as, as Bandler and Grinder, sent them out to Erickson said, uh, if you guys really want to know about patterns of communication, he's the man. So when they came back, it just really touched me in this um, unforgettable way that uh, what this guy was up to, um, it, it, it reached in it and just opened something inside of me that was a, a, like a fire got lit. And um, as I was mentioning earlier, it was, I, I had this feeling, th this is why I'm here. And um, so I got to go out about two months later uh, when John and Richard returned. And that was the beginning of a period of uh, over five years. And I'd usually go out on quarter breaks because I, I was in universities during that whole time. I was an undergraduate at Santa Cruz and I did six years of graduate study at Stanford. So on my quarter breaks, I would go out and spend anywhere from two to three to ten days with him. At a time? At a time. Right, and it was um, it was a wonderful experience. I mean, there's um, there's certainly uh, not a week that goes by without me being grateful uh, for something that I learned there. Well, actually, I did this process of detransidentification, which is something that. We were, we were really just interested in all sorts of interesting far out experiences and trying to experience and understand all the range of possibilities in hypnosis. And I think it was Grinder who came across this, uh, this series of articles in some of the hypnosis journals about uh, 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 subjects learning to go into deep trance and become a famous artist in a deep trance like Rembrandt and then showing that their uh, uh, artistic capacity was significantly improved by doing that. And so we thought, that's interesting. And as a 19-year-old, I was interested in, in getting out of myself in every way possible. So we decided to do the experiment uh, using me as a subject and me doing a deep trance identification with Erickson. And it was a really very, very profound experience. Um, the, I mean, in terms of learning hypnosis, the two things that happened when I went into trance and tapped into Erickson, or at least my, whatever my unconscious understanding was, was that when I opened my eyes, everything was quiet. And it was a very different uh, experience than I had assumed that Erickson, because he read all these incredibly clever strategies, that his mind must have been buzzing a mile a minute with all sorts of, of uh, manipulation. But what I experienced in that was everything was quiet. And, and then secondly, when I looked around, everybody was already in a trance. And, and that has been one of the most you know, important experiences that it wasn't that I had to put them into trance. They were there. They were already there. Their unconscious was already there. And so it, it was a great relief to realize that hypnosis is not something you do to, 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 to people, but that you attune to something that's there and you're looking to just draw it out and bring their attention to it. Erickson, uh, I think you said yesterday, would have been one of your sponsors yeah. in life. Um, 
if there was sort of one or two real great nuggets of advice, support, or way he impacted your life, I'm sure he's impacted your life in many ways, um, what really stands out for you from the Ericsson legacy? Um, you know, there's uh, about 15 years ago, uh, Jeff Zeig and Steve Langton, two other major students, uh, we had lunch with Ernie Rossi, another major student, and Ernie was writing this keynote address and he asked us each to write down what we considered uh, the three most important uh, principles or ideas in Ericsson's legacy. And all three of us wrote down utilization. Um, and um, I can't remember what uh, Jeff and Steve wrote down, but the number one thing that I wrote down was life is to be enjoyed. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's really a message that I got from him on such a deep level. And by that, I don't think he meant that you're just telling jokes all day and, and living it at a surface level. But the sense that y y we've got this, this little opportunity and uh, the meter's running and we could waste it all worrying or trying to be something we're not. And then at the end of our life, we, we look back and realize what was the point. So I knew him uh, when he was an old man. He had, he had suffered tremendously. He was in absolute pain every day. He usually had to do four or five hours of hypnotic pain control. And yet this was a guy who in a very deep, real way enjoyed life. Uh, for example, uh, one afternoon uh, I used to stay in his uh, office guest house, which was right next to his house. It was around dinner time and uh, I was coming in through the backyard to bring Mrs. Erickson something. And Erickson, who, as I said, uh, was enjoyed the color purple because the only color he could see, was sitting in the kitchen with a purple athletic jumpsuit <laughs> and uh, he was Didn't chopping mention. vegetables for the family dinner. And he looked up and he said in his sort of typical way with this little glimmer in his eye, uh, I'm, I'm doing my workout. <laughs> and I looked quizzically, as I often did, and I recognized that in his frail state, this was the most workout that he could do. Yeah. But he was totally into it, and then he looked with this big smile and he said, I always enjoy discovering what I can do and take great satisfaction in that. Uh, Joseph Campbell, as many people know, was this uh, American mythologist who uh, died what, about five years ago. And uh, in uh, 1949, I believe it was, came out with this book, Hero with a Thousand Faces, where he looked at um, all these different mythologies and, and tales from many, many different cultures and found that they shared this, this there was this common pattern that occurred in virtually every culture in storytelling and in, in ritual and drama, which was the notion of, of somebody going on this hero's journey. And the hero's journey, um, of, in, in the easiest version, uh, something that you're, you're kind of starting in paradise, you're starting in the garden, and then something happens and you get kicked out and you have to begin a process of healing yourself, finding yourself, going on your own way for a long period of time. 40 years in the desert, or its mythological equivalent. And through that, uh, beginning to create uh, an experience and cross these thresholds that allow you to achieve something in your consciousness that's never been achieved before. That is both healing for yourself, um, but equally importantly, uh, a healing gift that you then return to your community and are, are able to, to share with them. So it's a, it's a beautiful metaphor or map for uh, talking about uh, how you can think about your own life in, in terms of, of really generating the best quality life that's fulfilling for you and, and helpful to others. Erickson is a classic example of a hero's journey.